This week, the Clean Energy World Headquarters is not, in fact, located in the coldest place on the planet with a population. It's actually a city in Siberia where it's so cold, some people leave their gas cars running all winter. I'm not kidding. I would normally put a joke here, but it seems ridiculous to do so at this point. I had a professor who used to leave his car running for a whole class. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Terrorist. Mazda has announced a plug-in hybrid with a rotary gasoline engine. Because nothing says welcome to the future more than a wankle rotary engine. <laughs> Is that like a rotary phone? Anyway, I make the prediction that in a few years it will be harder to buy gas than to fuel an EV. And that means no more gas station sushi, Brian. A UK company is converting an electric Ford Mustang into a hearse. That's good news, because if I'm going straight to hell, I want to go electric. Then I want a parade. Also on this week's show, VW and Audi cars are shipping without heat pumps, and a floating wind turbine farm outdoes nuclear. All that and more on this week's edition of The Clean Energy Show. So an update on my induction cooktop. So I finally ordered one. That's the only update. Well, wow, that's a hell of an um, update, Brian. You finally got off your ass and clicked. Clicked your yes. mouse. So um, replacing our gas cooktop. With How did you shop for one? one? Tell me. Like, that that's a story. You know, not, it's not a story. Trust me. No, just, it's just it's this online. one looks good. That's the right price. You looked at Placed a couple of reviews. Order. Um, they said it would be two to six weeks, but I also got the feeling they weren't really sure how long it would take. <laughs> but, um, but that was what that they said, like two to e six weeks. E and uh, I'm busy moving the radon meter around my basement to try and identify radon hotspots so yep. I can uh, fix the radon gas problem in my house. Listen to That's previous kind of week's show to understand why. Yeah. And uh, Morris, Manitoba now has a Tesla supercharger. I was going and to look up where Morris, Manitoba was, and I got distracted. Where is it? It is just south of Winnipeg, and it matters to me because I love to go down to Fargo, North Dakota, home of the Fargo Film Festival. Okay. And so this helps the route from you drive from Regina to Winnipeg and then straight south to Fargo. So um, that, that stretch from Winnipeg to Grand Forks, I think it is, was a little bit long. So with this extra charger in Morris, it should oh, facilitate driving. Oh, Morris is like driving. The, the, kind of one of the last places you might expect an EV. It's a very conservative. I remember doing a, a documentary on that agriculture documentary, documentary in 89 yep. and uh, for the Soviets. And we went there, and I remember that's where all the... Um, well, there's a lot of th very Christiany things. It's very, um, it's very different than maybe the rest of Canada. Maybe kind of like the Weyburn of. Manitoba. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's it's a very small town, but but it Brian, just you and I them. went to Fargo. We didn't go that way. We we went a different way. Is this yeah, a longer we went way through the U.S.? I think it's about the same. I mean, it's if you're driving a gasoline car, it might be better to go straight through the U.S., go straight down because gas is cheaper in the U.S. But if you're driving electric now, this is the option. And in fact, our friend, our mutual friend, Diane, has a short film playing at the Fargo Film Festival at the end of March. So uh, we might drive down there with her, uh, down to the Fargo Film Festival. Oh, that'd be nice. Yeah. Um, please say hi to everyone. They won't remember yeah. me, but you can hold no, my picture. I think so. <laughs> Somebody will remember me. Somebody will remember yeah. you. I'm sure. Well, I hope so. I hope so, too. Um, yeah, you should be host. They should know you're coming so you can host roundtables and things. And uh, Yeah, no thanks. No, yeah, you're retired now, you lazy yeah. bastard. You're just <laughs> so lazy. Uh, I've been mentioning on previous week's shows about uh, electric cars in winter, and I promised this week that I would have an update about the, the only offering that is an EV from Toyota, the BZ4X, the uh, crossover. So it... Uh, uh, it does not heat its battery when it's unplugged. So that's nobody. Basically nobody but Nissan Leaf does that. Apparently these cars think they'll operate. However, this is what you argued last week, that the cars think that they'll operate, but they don't. Why do I know that? Because Toyota warns that below a mere minus 25 degrees Celsius, what's that? Nine, minus 9 Fahrenheit or something? I can't. Something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, they may not work. The all-wheel the all drive version just plain may not work. <laughs> so good try, Toyota. You're yeah. really 
getting into the whole EV thing when your fellow company uh, Nissan, your fellow country company Nissan, made a car that will work in minus of fifty five, pretty much. Um, yeah, and what you discovered was that the Leaf automatically starts heating your battery once it hits you know a certain temperature, even if it's not plugged in, just to to keep it warm and yeah uh, the manual but, specifies it it's minus 17 yeah. it kicks in turns off at minus 12 and as we know yeah like if you just let it freeze and, and other cars don't do that so if it's not plugged in it will it will freeze the, but i think the the thing the point i was trying to make last week was that they must have decided that it it doesn't damage the battery like they know that your car is not going to work until you plug it in and warm it up but they must have discovered that freezing the batteries down to 40 doesn't do permanent damage to them, or they probably would have included okay. that. Okay. Are you willing to put your money where your mouth hole is? No. You're not? Okay. As the host no. of the Clean Energy Show, a distinguished <laughs> man in the clean energy sector, you're not willing to leave your car unplugged in cold weather to see no, what I don't happens? want to do that. I don't want to do that. <laughs> okay. We'll have to leave it to another podcast then, because I don't have a Tesla. Yeah. There's lots of other people around who are testing it. I mean, um, yeah, uh, and it would it? be hard to know like what the long term damage. Like it would take years to figure out if there's long term. Oh, I don't damage care about the damage. Time. What I care about is does it work? Yeah, and I think we discovered that you know you were watching that guy from Denver, and no, they don't work once you know once it's I mean, cold soaked down to minus forty. It they don't really work until you plug them in and warm them up. Yeah, that was minus 30, I think, or approaching it. So that was was not good. The means, all this means, is it's not a problem for most people. But if you park in the street, if you're an apartment dweller, or if, you know, I mean, we're getting to the point where, uh, you know, we could we could have a three EV family theoretically here. We have a mm -hmm. three, uh, we're probably going to have two EVs soon. And my daughter could go out and uh, get a job, theoretically, and buy an e a used EV somewhere, you know, who knows? And she'd have to park on the street, so she wouldn't be able to, and we live in a very cold climate in the wintertime anyway, and I'm going to talk about another place that has a cold climate. <laughs> so I I don't know. It's just, it's a, it seems like a problem for some places, and although for most of the population of North America, it's not a problem, but it's it's like one of those things that could crop up once every five years or something that you could hit a temperature where your car doesn't work, and people still are not you know, going to accept that. They're going to want mm -hmm. their car to work all the time. Although, I mean, a lot of gas cars won't work either. If their if they're 12 volt battery is not in good condition, you might find out the hard way that it, you know. No, and I remember back when I lived in Toronto about 15, 20 years ago, it doesn't get as cold there, but, you know, every once in a while there'd be a bad cold snap. It would hit minus 25. And that's when everybody's 12 volt batteries died. You know, like if you've got a mild winter, they can kind of get through but uh yeah well you know anytime you hit minus 25 in a place like toronto like half the 12 volt batteries in town need to be replaced all right well let's get on with the show so we uh speaking of toyota and now mazda fellow japanese automaker uh we've been kind of mocking toyota and mazda for not moving fast enough in terms of evs uh mazda has only the mx30 in canada we say mazda everyone else says mazda um, so yeah, they had this EV with pretty poor range that they were selling in California, but they, you know, only sold a few hundred of them. And, uh, so they are refreshing it and turning it into a plug-in hybrid because the range was so poor. They're putting in a rotary engine, which is what Mazda is known for. They're the only ones that use rotary engines still. Um, it's kind of their thing. It's, um... I don't know that they're better or anything, but if you've ever sat in a, like a, a Mazda with a rotary engine, you rev the engine and the car doesn't move. Like there is something smooth about them. Is that right? When you've got pistons moving up and down, you know, you, you rev the car and the whole car kind of shakes a bit. Uh, but a rotary engine is kind of fun because it's, uh, it's smoother. It's just a, you know, You the, don't know anything cylinders. about how they work, eh? You just... Yeah. It's, it's you know, there's spark plugs and everything, but they drive a... a a rotating drum rather than being in cylinders. Okay. So, um, but yeah, so they've turned this, the MX-30 into a plug-in hybrid for the European market. They're not offering this in the U.S. Weirdly, they're still going to, they're going to bring back the poor range version to sell in the U.S., but the plug-in hybrid um, is only going to be sold they, in I Europe. I think the, the number they sold last year was in the dozens, like, 30 or 40 or something. <laughs> I, I think it might have been a couple of hundred. There was something like that. But um, 
Uh, anyway, so, you know, Mazda is just kind of uh, chugging along here. Um, this is kind of a similar car to, you know, like the original Chevy Volt that, um, you know, came out like a dozen years ago. Uh, you know, a range extender for an electric car. But, you know, the actual battery size for that version in Europe is smaller than the American one. They're going to keep selling that American one with the larger battery, but no uh, range extender. So... Uh, unfortunate news there from Mazda, still not getting with the EV program. What's it going to take? Because, uh, you know, things, are, with, especially with the Inflation Reduction Act in the United States, things are are really heating up. Like, you can hear the yeah. vibrations in the soil. I mean, things are moving. Yeah. And what's going on, Japan? Uh, even... Uh, you know, I mean, Nissan's only slightly better than Toyota with coming out with their, uh, yeah, uh, what's it, the uh, Ar Aria. Yeah. And, yeah, that's it's basically the same thing. They've got one offering and, and with hopes of more coming by 2030 when uh, it could be too little too late. So, yeah, we'll see how that goes. I really don't, I still, it's still been looking at Toyota Prius videos and, uh, people think they're okay, but I mean, they're they're yeah, they're twenty five year old technology now, and um, the the yeah. day's over. And I and I, I I can't explain why, but I hate driving my Prius. I mean, I would rather <laughs> drive my damn electric uh, Nissan Leaf without a heater mm -hmm. in the Canadian cold than drive the Prius because the Prius is smooth and quiet compared to most gas cars, but it's still a gas car and it still operates in that way. It's still you know, the, the gas pedal response is uh, delayed by the, uh, um, you know, spinning up the, uh, the fuel pump and making fire. And, and it's all stupid. It's all stupid, yeah. Brian. It's dumb. It's just, it's, we don't need that anymore. Nissan and Toyota, they blew their early lead. There are so many advantages to um, electric cars. You know, I was thinking that there's a lot of people who listen to our podcast are thinking of buying electric cars or have just bought them. And um, I'm starting to discover, you know, it, was, it used to be pretty easy. It was like a Nissan Leaf and then there was the Teslas. <laughs> there wasn't a whole lot of stuff around to yeah. understand. Now there's a lot of nuances between the vehicles and we're starting to learn. We still haven't got a lot of data on cold weather. You know, we still don't know uh, exactly how some of these things work in um, free cold snaps and things like that. And if, you know, we have, we've had a fairly... We've had a cold winter, but not an extremely cold winter here, right? You you haven't had any problems since you got your heater fixed, and I haven't heard of any other Tesla owners having problems this yeah. year. No, here. last winter was a lot worse, yeah. There was some uh, problems that I guess got resolved, so that's good. But anyway, uh, yeah, I might have a an EV battery or EV uh, school segment coming in. And we're working on it in the lab, and it's, it's batting around and seeing if the budget's there. And uh, nice. we'll uh, maybe uh, roll that out soon with a little segment every week on um, just the nuances of owning an EV and charging and so, stuff like that. So Yakutsk, that is a city in Siberia. Now, my uh, geographically trained son who watches YouTube about uh, all kinds of things, including geography and climate, uh, tells me that they send a lot of uh, dissidents there. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's the, uh, yeah, that's the punishment. But Same Wikipedia just, doesn't say Iberia. that. Wikipedia doesn't say that. They say that that is a, a place in Siberia that has a population in the area of 350,000 and it's grown it's really a lot. It's like doubled in the last 20 years. Uh, it's warm like you and I have it in the summertime. So it's got a sort of a Southern Canadian summer climate. But in the winter, in the winter, it's really cold. It used to be recently minus 38 as an average winter temperature in the winter months. Average. <laughs> that's Celsius. So that's yeah. that's about the same in Fahrenheit. It's around minus 40. But apparently that's popped up by a couple of degrees because, as you know, and as many of our listeners know, the north is warming faster than anywhere else on Earth. So they're actually two degrees warmer than they used to be on mean temperatures already. Um, but I've watched some YouTube videos there and I, because I've been the reason I brought this up is because I've been boasting about Regina, Canada, and the southern plains of Canada where we live, where the world headquarters of the uh, Clean Energy Show is located, um, being the most populated, coldest place around because we can get down to minus 40 or you know a little below that 
some winters for a short period mm -hmm. of time usually. Well, this place has it all the time, and they're bigger than us because <laughs> they're crazy. <laughs> it's it's really cold. And yes, people, it is a culture there to leave your car running the entire winter. I don't know how you gas up. I guess you turn it <laughs> off at the gas station because it's warm. Well, and, hopefully you turn it off because you're supposed to. That's, you know, if you read the rules at the gas pump, you're supposed to turn it off before you fuel up. And I've said this on the show before a long time ago, but I'm going to bring it up again. My uh, brother-in-law works in the oil industry as a safety manager, I think, in, in some respects. And he, uh, when we went on a road trip with him to a funeral, uh, he wanted us to touch the car as we got out to decharge our static. Right. And it doesn't say that on the sign, but he says no. You'll blow up if you don't. I suppose that is possible, yes. That's, that's probably going far because I think 99.99999% of people don't do that and people have rarely blow up due to a static charge. A gas pump is usually from something else, uh, yeah. you know, like a gas pump breaking and shooting gas all over the hot engine or something or smoking even, but not static electricity. <laughs> but anyway, uh, people leave their cars running the entire winter. Be, just so they can have a car. They will <laughs> leave it running for days, go fill it up, mm -hmm. and leave, it just leave it running, idling. And the, the pollution is a problem because, you know, in the winter when it's that cold, yeah, the air doesn't go anywhere. The pollution doesn't go yeah. anywhere. It just sinks and sits there mm -hmm. and you breathe it. And, yeah, they hang bags. I've seen video of hanging bags and meet out their apartment windows because what the hell, they're... They're Russian and, you know, you've, I've thought about having a cooler in the backyard because we've run out of space in the deep freeze or something. Yeah. Oh, I have absolutely done that in the winter for sure. But you don't hang it out your front window. Not the front window. No, it's on the back porch. Someone's and, bound to take it. And I may have told this story before, but my father-in-law once drove around all winter with a frozen turkey in the trunk of his car because he didn't have room for it in his freezer. But, you know, you leave it in the trunk of the car, it'll stay frozen all winter. Yeah, well, I I know so many winters here where it gets to minus, you know, it gets to plus temperatures occasionally. The Chinooks, yeah. we call them. They, and more so than it used to, it seems. And, you know, freezer temperatures are actually quite cold, minus 17 or something like that. So once you get, yeah. I don't know, is that turkey safe? I'm, I'm just asking. I'm just asking. Yeah. <laughs> We'll see. But I often, like, we just chill drinks, you know, out on the porch, too. Sure. Like, uh, I, yeah, I've nice. done that. I've I've like made a run an errand and and decided I needed a drink for supper when I came home and it was frozen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. If you don't if you don't time it right, but you know I've often thought that it is weird that and I may have said this on the show before too, but it's weird that we use electricity in the winter to cool our fridges and freezers when there's an unlimited supply of cold air. And so really all of our fridges and freezers should have just a pipe going to the outside so that we can get that for free. And we just open that pipe in the wintertime and it just, you know, sucks it in because... Yeah. Uh, yeah. I like that. I wonder if anyone's invented something like that or if they've even bothered. Certainly you're Believe wasting... Believe me, I've thought about it, but I'm not enough of an inventor to figure <laughs> out how to do it. You'd be wasting electricity to freeze things in... Uh, in Kikusk. Am I saying that right? I've I've recorded Yakutsk. it here. Something Yakutsk. like that. Yakutsk. Yakutsk. I I can't <laughs> say my S's or my T's and K's together very well. Um I need to exercise my, my vocal cords before I do the show. That's what I should be doing. Uh, you should yeah, those warm up exercise that, that theater actors do. Sure, I have to learn those. As an untrained <laughs> actor, I think I have to learn those. So it is the largest city of the world with an average winter temperature below minus thirty or minus 22 Fahrenheit. And uh, the primary economic activity stems from mining coal, primarily. So, yeah, you. Uh, why would you want to go there if you weren't sent there by Putin? You know, like, why? Well, somebody would say the same thing about yeah, us. Yeah, and they'd be right, Brian. They'd be right. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's been a long winter. I don't like it. I'm starting to question it. I, I'm getting stuck in my driveway now because... Uh, it warmed up a bit, and, and they've been salting the roads, and the salt gets on the driveway and starts making the snow slushy, and then I I start to sink in what was once a perfectly hard-packed, drivable driveway yeah. from a lazy man who didn't shovel it down to the surface. So, Gold and diamonds are also mined there, and head, the mining headquarters of the companies are there. 
Uh, and people, Brian, get this. They don't buy eyeglasses that are metal eyeglasses with metal frames because they stick to your flesh. Like, Yikes. Like the uh, a Christmas Story movie, you know, like um, sure. flesh and don't. cold metal don't mix. Don't don't lick the pole. But they literally do not do that. So everybody has plastic glasses. It's just crazy. It's crazy that they leave their cars running. Now I I tried hard to find something about somebody having an EV there. Yeah, nothing. I don't know yeah, how you would get I mean, it there. Yeah, it's uh, that would be tricky. But yes, it's true. I did have a professor that he would come and teach a class. It was a three hour class, and he would leave his car running the whole time. <laughs> and he told people that. Yeah. When, when you were, in, you were a student in the early eighties, right? So that was the eighties. Yeah. Mid eighties. Uh, that's a bit different, but still it's, it's excessive. I mean, I, I didn't know anyone who did that. No. And I will say you did have more problems. Like cars start better in the cold now, like back in the seventies and eighties, yeah, you true. still had more problems where you couldn't start your car. Um, but that has improved over the years. But I have seen some cars around here in the recent cold snaps that have been boosted by your CAA, your AAA equivalent, and not started, and then they're towed away. I drive back, hmm. I get drop my kid off at school, drive back, and then towing the car away. It didn't work with the boost. So, yeah, sometimes the the gas chambers get too cold to make wow. fire. So not a problem with an electric car. Uh, and, you know, an electric car, the 12-volt battery can go too, as mine did, and that will cause your car not to work, but yeah, it doesn't doesn't have to do much. That's the nice thing about it. It doesn't have to crank anything or move anything. Yeah. Uh, okay, so a story here from Electrek. There's a company in the UK called Coleman Milne, and they are turning the Ford Mustang Mach-E into either a hearse or a limousine. And the pictures look great. I don't know if you saw these pictures. But I did, the, yes. Yeah, the, the Ford Mustang hearse looks fantastic. It looks really great. It reminds me a little bit. Did you ever see that movie Harold and Maude? No, I didn't. I haven't. It's a movie from the um, early 70s with Ruth Gordon where she sort of starts this relationship with a younger man. He's like this sort of teenage kid who's a bit weird. And he takes one of those Jaguar S-type, those amazing, you know, Jaguar sports cars, and he turns one of those into a hearse. Yeah. Uh, that's what the Mustang reminds me. It's not quite as nice, but um, it's a really sharp looking uh, hearse. And uh, it's a perfect use case for an electric vehicle because, you know, you typically don't have to drive huge distances with a hearse. These are typically small distances. So this just makes perfect sense. Like these are vehicles, all hearses should be electric. And, you know, of course, they will be soon. Electric Vehicle Advantage 4012, leaving the car on at the graveside without spewing without fumes and noise because yeah. you want tranquility. Yeah. And But you can Which, leave the car on. If it's minus 1,000 or if it's minus, if it's zero, if it's plus a little bit, you yeah. can leave that sucker heating or cooling if it's hot in the summertime. Keep that corpse warm or cold, rather. I mean, um, however you do. It's got a large viewership window. So, I mean, if you're the Stockton corpse is going down the street to the funeral yard, yeah. uh, well, everybody will be able to have a good look at the yeah. whatever you're encased in. <laughs> everybody would want to see that cat for sure. <laughs> I just, unless you're just a frozen corpse just sitting there on a plank and you're too cheap mm -hmm. for a for a board for a, for a but uh they do seem to have extended the wheelbase of both of these cars so i'm not sure like this is something obviously it's been done for many years with you know regular gas cars you stretch them and turn them into limousines so these are stretched for both the hearse and for the limousine i don't know if that's a little bit trickier because they're electric but they seem to have uh, figured out a way to do it brian i think it's easier because they're electric because you have to run a power cable to the rear motor if there is one mm -hmm. If there's not, even easier. Uh, you just extend the cables to the rear lights, but you don't have to extend the exhaust or anything like that. So, um, yeah, and I, I've seen Teslas, all kinds of Teslas done the same thing, especially in the UK. It seems to be a very, I mean, they're spending a lot of money adapting a car anyway. You might as well, it's probably not going to cost any more to do, a, to do an EV or it could be less, I don't know, but... Uh, yeah. yeah, the uh, 
if I had a limo, and I should, I mean, we should have a clean energy show limo, let's face it, um, you know, it should be electric. You know, and it totally. should say on a sign, electric limo. Yeah. Uh, carrying the uh, still alive Brian Stockton to his coffee shop meeting. We'll put an, an electric hot tub in there, too. <laughs> electric hot tub. All I want, Brian, is an electric fridge. I want my <laughs> drinks to be cold. I mean, uh, you could stock it with ice, sure. It's a limo. You yeah. have a driver. But, you know, I like fridges in, in vehicles. And speaking of heat, uh, Volkswagen and Audi, which is an affiliated company of Volkswagen, uh, they've started to ship some of their cars now without heat pumps. And this is because of the semiconductor shortage that is still going on. So Audi was the first one to announce it. Um, the Audi Q4 e-tron, the electric Audi, they had to take the heat pumps out because they didn't have the chips, I guess, to run it. So putting in a resistive heater. And now the same thing uh, with the ID4 is that some of them are now going out with a resistive heater rather than a heat pump. And of course, it'll still work and you'll still get heat. But as we discussed many times, the heat pumps are way more efficient. Are they so changing the will... price? Because um, the, that's a sometimes like a $2,000 option on vehicles. Yeah, the Audi customers are getting some kind of a break. It says the VW customers will not be getting a credit or a refund as Screw the heat you, pump is an VW. optional feature in that car. So because it's optional, not in Canada. they just go with It is standard in Canada. I will point out that was one of the nice things about the VW, if you're buying it north of the border, is standard heat pump, which means more efficiency in cold weather. And yeah. that heated windshield, which I envy and, and, and desire. Yeah, so I don't know how long this shortage is, is going to go on, but that would appear to be the case at this moment for um, Audi and VW. Okay, here's a question that you're not going to be able to answer. What the hell does a, a chip shortage have to do with a heat pump? Do they have their own chips? I mean, come on. Yeah, I guess I assume it's some kind of a controller that, that controls the heat pump. God, this, this chip shortage is infuriating. And it's still going on. It's it, crazy. It's supposed to go on for the whole 2023, apparently. Brian, here's my TikTok rant. I'm, I'm doing this for TikTok on the podcast, but it's also going to be a TikTok. I don't know why. It'll be faster on TikTok because the pauses will be cut out because, you know, TikTokers can't stand pauses. <laughs> yeah. Okay, here's the deal. Gas stations will be harder to find next decade than EV chargers. Hear me out because I'm always right, always. The U.S. and Canada currently are on track to reach sales of 25% of new car sales in just two years from now. Of just EVs, two years from now, 25% be EVs two years from now. Now, in other parts of the world, this has gone faster. So we know how these things go because we've both hit and surpassed 5% uh, in the last uh, 2022. So the U.S. government is targeting 50% sales of new cars to be EVs by 2030. And I personally, expert clean energy show host, predict will reach 50% in North America by 2028. Unless, barring World War or anything stupid that Putin does. Stupid Putin. Anyway, uh, yeah, so that's going to be large amounts of new sales. So gas stations, as you know, um, gas stations, as you know, are operate at a very thin margin. Yeah. And large swaths of the developed world are set to end full gas sales by 2035. So if that was happening five years from now, would you go buy a gas car? Yeah, if you were stupid. Not everyone's stupid. And not everyone um, realizes that uh, what's going on, but they will by then. And because, you know, the neighbor effect and everything else, gas stations run do run at a low margin, 2%, according mm -hmm. to Fortune magazine. They did an analysis in August of this year, or last year, rather. And by comparison, they say the banking industry operates at a margin of 30%. Yay, banks. Thanks for taking <laughs> my fees. So we did a comparative analysis, they say, that looked at gross profit margin for U.S. gas stations between 2020 and 2022, and we found case studies where margins were so thin, this is during the pandemic, that retailers were selling at a loss, which you hear that happens from time to time. 
Yeah, well, it's it's um, a bit like you know, uh, movie theaters are often brought up in the same way. Like the you know, the movie theaters just kind of break even on the ticket prices, and then because popcorn is fairly cheap and soda pop is fairly cheap, that's where they make their money. And I think in the old days, gas stations made their money by doing repairs. Like most yeah. gas stations had a couple of bays, and they would have mechanics there. Um, now they've turned into more often more often as like convenience stores. But okay, here's the thing. I don't think profit margins on electric car charging is going to be that much better, right? It's going to be yeah. fairly low once competition comes into yeah. effect. Yeah, once there's lots of them, the competition will keep the prices pretty low. And they're they're kind of pricey now. They're kind of it gets some places it's a, you know it's about the same to drive. You save a little bit by driving electric, but not as much as you should, especially if you're charging at home, uh, driving in the city. Now, you might say, Brian, that apartment dwellers will keep gas stations in cities uh, because EV chargings, they'll be at gas stations, right? Well, not so much because, you know, in the future, in the near future, EV drivers in the cities are going to have a lot more options with level two charging stations as more people adopt EVs. Grocery stores will have EV chargers. How long do you spend at a grocery store? Probably an hour. Yeah. Uh, if you if that person who goes to a grocery store, we don't anymore. We order ahead because we're lazy. Pandemic yeah. changed that. That uh, although my wife spends a lot of time ordering groceries, like she'll spend way more than she ever would at the store by three it, it, by factor of three. It takes way longer to order online than I think it should, and every time it irritates me. Well, the thing is, you order the same things. Can't you just go through the checklist and yeah, and then yes. they give us the wrong things? It, but this is another rant altogether. Takes longer. So, yeah, you'll have uh, level two charging, which you can have at home at 240 volts, like a dryer plug, at grocery stores, at workplaces, because government policy uh, and people who want to retain good workers will put in level two EV chargers. They're already there with a lot of tech companies that want to, uh, you know, those people are buying EVs the first and they want to make sure that those people have the chargers. They mm -hmm. go to their workplace and ask for them. They're not that expensive for a business in a lot of cases. Uh, there's different uh, strategies for that. Movie theaters, shopping malls. Um, yeah, those will have charged. They already have a few now. So you will just go about what you got to do and not charge at a gas station. So that's the reason for not having gas stations in cities that have EV chargers. I think those are going to go to business uh, faster than people think, and it's going to start slow. You'll start to see one or two close, and then a couple of years later, oh, a bunch of them closed. And uh, yeah, there'll be cheaper. Some of these options, Brian, will be free. There's a lot of free charging in the United States right now. People who seek them out to save a few, <laughs> a few yeah. bucks will do that. No, I charged for free at Parks Canada Chargers the you know last summer. That was great. I don't know if you saw, but Tesla sent out a tweet. In the Tesla app, they actually keep track of how much you spend on charging and then can compare it to what you've saved with gasoline. So Tesla sent out a, a tweet recently that in the past year, Tesla drivers around the world collectively saved $2 billion dollars um, on gasoline, like the, the, what what they drove would have cost two billion dollars in gasoline. Why isn't that a story in the clean energy show? That's two billion dollars out of the oil company's pockets. That's pretty yeah. significant. And uh, according to my app, it says I, I saved twenty five hundred dollars in the last year. Nice, nice. You don't do a well. You've you've done some some. A lot of your driving is probably in the highway, kilometers wise, right? Mileage. -wise. Yeah, and I think that. Um, it um like it's it's maybe not accurate like it says I saved twenty five hundred but it's maybe not accurate for me because I just wouldn't have driven as much if I had a gasoline car so ah. that um that figure is perhaps um, exaggerated but um, uh, okay yeah savings twenty five hundred that's what it's telling me I saved twenty five hundred dollars by driving electric for the last year so gas stations like EV chargers are more likely to be available in the country I believe for a short time because they will still be needed for long distance travel, much like superchargers are for EVs right now. But I predict very soon, starting in 2028, there will be less, not a lot less, but you'll notice it more in the next decade. And by the end of the decade, certainly even be even possibly by the middle of the next decade, 10 years from now, it will be easier to charge an EV. There, you'll, you'll have a hard time. You won't want to buy a gas car because you won't be able to charge it. It won't be as reliable as it used to be. 
and gas users will have to start planning trips more carefully, like early adopters of the EV revolution are doing now. Country gas stations, I predict, will keep less hours. You'll have maybe something that's not open till midnight. It'll only be open until uh, 8 or 10 o'clock or 9 o'clock in the evening, and so you'll have to time your trip that way. No, and it's one of the things that isn't often talked about with uh, EV charging, but they're open 24 hours a day, and gas stations are not always open 24 hours a day. Yeah, and aside from, you know, the danger of being plugged in and sort of trapped there, it's uh, it's a great convenience to be able to do. So car chargers, yeah, 24 hours a day, even in the most remote of places. It does, you, know, you don't need an attendant there, uh, other than maybe a security cam for people stealing copper or something. I believe that with the reduction of gas stations, even if it's just reduced by a small percentage, you'll start to see lineups. The, the first thing you'll see is lineups and waiting times at gas stations. And then you'll see it'll become you know, quicker to charge a car as the charging of cars gets faster then sometimes it'll be, it's not necessarily assured that charging your, or gas in your car will be faster than charging an EV. And finally, I predict, and this is important, Brian, that a chocolate bar will cost half as much as an electric car charging station on the highway than any gas station, city, or country. Do you know how much a chocolate bar costs at a gas station? Do you have any idea, man? It's like uh, three no. bucks. Oh, it's yeah? Like, it's a lot. Because that's where they're getting all their money from. So it's, it's like a movie theater. They overcharge you yes, for the it's, it's, Gas stations are like movie theaters. <laughs> they, they're they not making any money on the movie. They're making the money on what they're selling. But um, at an, an EV charging station, what you're saying is... It's a vending make, machine. Uh, yeah, and, it'll be just And all the something. vending machines I've seen at uh, rest stops on highways, reasonably priced. Chocolate bars, mm -hmm. chips, everything you want. So there you go. That's an important distinction. And now it's time for the Tweet of the Week. Yes, every week I pick out a tweet. But this week, Brian, I've picked out two. I'll tell you why. Because I haven't picked out a lot of other things to talk about this week. So I'm going to highlight two tweets here. One is from Danielle Breton. Um, and the federal uh, zero emission sales regulation in Canada... It's uh, Daniel, I think you might want to do that again. Oh, pardon me, it's Daniel. Daniel Breton of, from, um, I think, Mountain Equipment Co-op. No, I'm not sure. Daniel Breton tweets, the federal uh, ZEV sales regulation in Canada, some say that Canada is much larger than Norway because Norway is a cold country. And they, don't, they say, well, it doesn't matter. They don't drive a lot in Norway. Uh, they say Canadians drive a lot more because we're a giant country. Compared mm -hmm. to Norway. Norway, you're tiny. I'm sorry, but it's true. And in Canada, we only drive 7.4 kilometers a day more. That's about mm, four and a half miles or something like that. So we only drive a little bit more on a daily basis. It's 15,000 instead of 12,000 kilometers. Uh, so that doesn't count. That's one uh, tweet that I wanted to highlight because that's been brought up a lot by EV naysayers in Canada. Yeah, of course, Norway is the big success story for EVs, but people are always trying to pick out things why this won't work other places, and they're always wrong. Mark Z. Jacobson, um, he is an EV analyst. Uh, this floating, or pardon me, a, um, a clean energy analyst. This floating offshore wind farm that is highlighted in the Offshore Magazine uh, article, that is a magazine, yes, there's Horse Fancy and Offshore Wind Farms as well, has its own magazine. Wow. So we should be subscribed. To, they should send us free ones, actually. Absolutely. So, this floating, this is floating. Remember, floating is a new technology because it's in depths of uh, where the water, you can't just, you know, go down. It has to be uh, floating and anchored by wires to way below. So usually a three-point wire. The floating, wind shore, the floating offshore wind farm has a capacity factor averaged over five years of 54%. This is one of the first floating wind, um, wind turbine farms. Now, capacity factor, what's that, you ask? That means that, uh, like, I can have a solar panel on my roof weight rated at 10, um, 10 kilowatts, say. So sure. that means on the sunniest middle part of the day at noon, it'll perhaps give me 10 kilowatts if it's not hazy, if there's no birds yeah. flying around, and perfect conditions. Yeah. So, but my capacity factor overall is probably around 20% or less because yeah. the night comes and all that. So yeah. uh, a wind turbine... 
you know, nuclear has a capacity factor too. Usually they're rated at 80, 90%. And if anytime they're below that, you're costing more money than what you said you were going to cost. This is something yeah, we've talked about. Yeah, they're not before. always running at full capacity. But the cost to build them, the same. Yeah. So this floating offshore wind, for, uh, uh, offshore wind farm had a capacity uh, of five years of 54%, which, you know what, that exceeds the French nuclear fleet of last year which was only at 52.9% because of problems. And that's a, that's a big deal for yeah, the AG so, nuclear. And this is, again, thing people bring up all the time is that nuclear can work as good base load power, but it's not as good base load power, I think, as, as people imagine it is. Because it's not reliable. Like, there's, there are so many factors, including climate change, that is causing them to have to shut down, whether it's low water, too hot of water, these are frightening things, and we're just at the beginning, Ryan. It's just crazy. But that is a very interesting fact, that offshore wind is closer to a base load, depending on where you are, because the wind blows steady all the time. And with these new larger turbines, they can pick up wind from the higher altitudes. So that's quite interesting. Time for some story updates. Brian, why don't you start us off? Yeah, so about a year ago on the show, we talked about Stephen Guibault, who is Canada's environment minister, and he was appointed to that position about a year ago. And uh, the title of this article, this is from the Canadian press, an activist in office, Stephen Guibault's first year as environment minister. I thought this was interesting because it is a Canadian story, but I think this has universal appeal because it's a very unusual thing really that happened that, you know, Stephen Guibault was an activist and we talked when he was appointed about a year ago, your favorite story was, you know, he, he was involved in many different kind of publicity raising stunts like, uh, you know, climbing off of the CN Tower, hanging a banner off the CN Tower. Borderline like illegal or possibly illegal. Yeah. Like I'm sure he was charged with mischief. But the most fun was that, uh, you know, he and some other people went to the premier of Alberta, Canada's oil province. And they started to uh, install solar panels on the roof of his house uh, without his knowledge or permission, uh, which, you know, makes James laugh a lot. <laughs> You'd have to know the politician in question. It's just, yeah. uh, and I don't know them personally, of course, but uh, yeah. So, yeah, it is, I could see this happening in Europe, but it did seem like a weird thing to happen here in Canada where if yeah. you have... Uh, you know, a drunk, well, I can't say that because our premier has a drunk driving conviction. He's in office. <laughs> so that's not good. <laughs> Usually you have to be squeaky clean to get into office in Canada. Yeah. So this is very unusual that, you know, a climate activist has been uh, appointed to this position and he's done a lot of good things. There's, but, um, you know, this is kind of an overview of what he's managed to accomplish and it, it's quite good. Um, it, you know, there's a nice little bit here when he was first, uh, appointed, it was, um, you know, uh, there was a climate summit, um, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, they flew over to the UK, but then he made everybody, him and his staff all take a train another 500 yeah. kilometers yeah. because of course that's lower carbon. Wow. Good for him. Um, but the, the trickier thing is that he did in fact approve um, a large uh, oil and gas product uh, project. So uh, it says here, the most difficult decision I had to make by far was Bay du Nord. There's no doubt about that. That was uh, an extremely difficult day. It's an offshore project off of Newfoundland and Labrador that's going to produce more than uh, 300 million barrels of oil over its lifespan. And, you know, he, that was a trade-off that he felt like he had to make. Um, it said, you know, it was a heartbreaking moment. Uh, someone who, in theory, should have said no to that project. Um, it's, but you know, the data suggests we are going to be using oil for a long time. Coal is definitely being phased out. But his reasoning being that we are still using oil. We are going to keep using oil. Um, so you know, he made that compromise, which you know the hardcore environmentalists obviously would not have. But this is what happens when you have you know, an activist in office, you have to make compromises. Political life is all about compromises. So, you know, that's a compromise I, I wish that he hadn't made, but, you know, you can see why it might happen. Oh, I bet that keeps him up at night. This is a compromise <laughs> of working in the Canadian government. Where you, 
you know, it's still yeah. not going to appease anybody. All the oil and gas people are going to hate his ass. Yeah, something they awful. all hate him anyway. So, um, yeah. you know, and Trudeau spent lots of money buying pipelines and stuff uh, to the benefit Did of nothing. the oil industry, Did nothing for and him he doesn't get any credit for that. So, yeah. you know, uh, we'll keep keep an eye on that and, and see what he's able to do in the future. But he has managed to enact lots of very positive uh, climate, uh, you know, laws and rules in Canada. He's got some very challenging stuff on his desk right now because that uh, shifty Joe Biden with his Inflation Reduction Act, I guess all the investment in Canada is rushing to the states, to the United States. And yeah. he's got to come up with a counteroffer to keep it here. And he's been slow to do that. And everybody might be gone. They might have packed up their boxes and left. This is what I'm hearing all around. Yeah. Um, by the time he gets around to it in the spring, which is, you know, it takes a while to do this. You can't just pull this out of his butt because it's yeah. going to cost and it's going to have to actually work. He's going to have to consult with industry, what will keep them here, keep the investment here. But, you know, that is going to take a lot of, uh, right when we were trying to get the investment in clean energy in Canada and jobs and everything that came with it going, it's got sucked into the United States by Mr. Biden. Which I'm glad he's doing because it's better for the planet. <laughs> Ultimately, yeah. it's it's uh, it's a big plus for the planet. And Brian, I also wanted to say that I, I don't think I brought this up before because we've talked about Amazon's goal of buying 100,000 Rivian-made delivery trucks uh, by 2024. They've pushed it back all the way to 2030, and I don't think I've heard that before, and I'm not sure I mentioned it on the show. So I wanted to mention that. Part of that probably has to do everything to do with Rivian. They're having some problems getting going right now. Yeah, every manufacturer of EVs is having difficulty scaling. Um, yeah, there is a good review. I think you mentioned it on YouTube, the Doug DeMuro um, YouTube channel. Um, he does a nice review of one of these Rivian electric uh, delivery vans for Amazon, which is, I don't know, I thought it was really interesting. I thought it was too, because um, it, it's kind of uh, rethinking the whole thing. They're, they're sort of starting fresh and they... They made it with all the tech so you can see completely around. It lets the van get driven away if it's hijacked, but only for a little while to keep the driver safe. I was watching a CNBC long video on, on these new vans and, and delivery workers. There was a guy who got eaten by a dog or killed by a dog last summer, I think, that they Yikes. briefly touched on. And, you know, that, that's horrible. But, yeah, they um, – so – they're doing all kinds of things like logging houses that have pets so you know when you get there and stuff like that. And I, I, there was a guy who showed a, a, his own video of the Amazon uh, charging stations. These are privately held companies that buy these and do these uh, last mile delivery services. So you have to sort of start your own company to do it. Yeah, that's what I didn't understand because – uh, so, that, yeah, it's sort of a subcontractor, but I guess Amazon is supplying them with the vans, even though they're a subcontractor? Yeah, they're supplying them with the vans because they want to have a low carbon footprint, but they also want to have safe employees. And they regulate, you know, the people who work for Amazon. They're trying to clean up their the way they treat people, not peeing in bottles and things like that. <laughs> uh, but so, yeah, these vans are great. They have a lot more room to get around in and everything's sort of automated. There's less to do the heated steering wheel and cooled seats and all kinds of things. The door pops open when you stop, so you don't have to open and close the door all day. Yeah. And uh, things like that. And, you know, no. it's just, uh, they also showed, the guy showed a, a video of the home um, parking lot, and there was this line as far as you, I could see of chargers. Basically, they were kind of like the, uh, the chargers we have in Canada for, um, you know, kind of like a, a, a electrical conduit that's on wooden posts but those were all level two or level three or high level two chargers i think uh so they charge them overnight and they start again the next day uh so okay so uh speaking of the inflation reduction act so a lot of these things are kicking in now as of january 1st um, a lot of the provisions of the inflation reduction act are happening now in the U.S., and this is related uh, somewhat to the Tesla price cuts. This was a massive price cut that Tesla announced for Canada and the U.S. Of course, this is also related to the demand. As they increase their output, they seem to be hitting uh, the peak of their demand at the prices that those cars were at. And uh, so, yeah, probably an 
everyone has maybe even heard about this already because it's been a, a very large news story for the last several days. But um, yeah, here in Canada, the Tesla Model 3 standard range is now eligible for a federal uh, rebate again, $5,000, which is what I got when I bought my car about three years ago. Uh, and the price Tesla, is about the same, right? So they've, yeah. they've been creeping up since the day you bought your car, pretty much. Yeah, it's it's about and back to where it was. That Sorry? was spring of 2019 you bought your car? Yeah, it was, it was March. 2020. Um, because it was delivered by hands-free, yeah. touchless Yeah, delivery. so it was right at the start of the pandemic. So it'll be th coming up three years in, a, in wow. a couple of months. So That's a third of a news, decade, Brian. For Canadians, uh, eligible again for the $5,000 tax credit. And then in the U.S., several models now eligible for the $7,500 um, tax credit from the Inflation Reduction Act. So this brings the price of the standard range Model 3 down to thirty six or 38000 um, The nice. rear-wheel drive, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, down okay. to 43 minus the 7500 and then a couple of the Model Y models are now eligible for that as well. So this drive drops those prices by a lot because they had really cranked up the prices of the Model Y. Is that a supply the, issue? Are you concerned as an investor here? What's going on? Because that's it, a big, big jump. Yeah, it was concerning at first because obviously this is going to affect their gross margins. They were making insane profits on each car, like up to upwards of 30%. Um, so, you know, it's not going to be that anymore, but since they're also increasing their output, the hope is that, you know, economies of scale, they'll be able to bring their prices down more. So, um, th this will affect their margins. The margins will be lower. The profits will be lower, but not by that much, I don't think. And I think at these pricing levels, we're going to get back to that sort of wait list days again, where people are going to have to wait a couple of months to, uh, to get their Teslas. Okay. Well, Brian, that brings us to the lightning round. We like to end the show every week with a fast-paced look at the stories from the week in clean energy and transportation. Let's begin. An oil executive will be running next year's COP conference in the UAE. Ooh. Ugh. <laughs> The Sultan El Jaber, Jaber, Jaban. How do you say that? Damn I don't it. know, El Jaber. Um, has a green credentials, they say, but he's, you know, still committed to pumping more oil. That's going to be awkward, and I don't like that. I can't see anything good happen. Why is it in the UAE? You know, because they're throwing up a few solar panels. Come on, like, don't have cop there. That's we're at such a critical junction in the fight against climate change that we cannot be. Um, you know, giving it to the oil business like that, or oil, you know, petrol states for that matter. A group, get this, this is my funny story of the week. A group of Republican lawmakers in, where, Wyoming, introduced a bill last week urging the legislature to seek to phase out the sale of new electric vehicles by 2035. You heard me right. I was not uh, errant in my reading of that. They want to phase out... New electric vehicle sales, just like we're yeah. trying to phase out new gas. Because, you know, there have to be dickheads about it and have to be threatened and cowardly. Electric vehicles are impractical and their batteries hog precious resources, these intelligent lawmakers in Wyoming said. And I also suspect that this is, in part, a publicity stunt that they probably realize that it's not actually going to happen. But they can, I don't know, get some press and here we are talking about it. Um, a supposed ban on, on EVs that will never happen. I say we ban Wyoming by 2035. We'll phase it out. Um, I'm happy with that. Although there's a few tour stops there, but not many, just Yellowstone. Uh, Hertz and Uber are expanding their partnership to bring up to 25,000 EVs to European capital cities. This is another indicator of the tide of economics in industry uh, going electric, Brian. This is just one of the markers along the way, so I thought I would throw that in this week. CarMax in the United States sold over half of its Tesla inventory in 24 hours because they reduced it greatly, didn't they? I assume, yeah. So CarMax is a used car seller? Oh, yeah. You haven't seen the commercials? No. 
oh, come on, man. They're, they're, <laughs> they drive it right to your house. Oh, wow. It's like Tesla, except for any used car you want to buy. So they're the big, one of the big retailers in the States for used vehicles. And you can, um, yeah, that's coming here too, which I'm hoping to take advantage of maybe someday. Yeah, so the price of used Teslas is coming down as well because the price of new ones is coming down as well. I If I'd sold mine about six months ago, I probably could have sold it at the peak of the market and gotten yeah. probably even more than I paid for it if I'd oh, sold yeah. it six months ago. Which is crazy. But now it's we're back down to uh, I would have to take a loss on it. Yes, it's time for a clean energy show fast fact. Bloomberg says heat pumps have already replaced about 20% of the boilers in Europe, saving customers, get this, get this, $100 billion a year by switching the heat pumps. $100 billion. Wow. I mean, we're just starting. This is not like, oh, we've switched and it's saving us $100 billion. It's like we just looking at the tip of the iceberg. We pricked it with a pin, the tip of this iceberg, and it's $100 billion off the table right there. So that's another hundred billion out of the uh, out of the coffers of you know the bad guys, and this is according to data from the European Heat Pump Association, which we are not currently members. So many things to buy memberships for now, Brian. We have to buy our memberships for the European Heat Pump Association. From Ars Technica, the world's reservoirs are getting gunked up with sediment slowly, but surely, in a process that could rob the power generating dams of nearly 30% of their storage capacity. We talk about pumped hydro with existing electricity generating dams. You pump it back up with your excess solar in the day and you use it at night. Well, there could be 30% less storage capacity, which is a concern. This has nothing you know, seriously to do with climate change. It's more like they've been around for a while and they're just sort of getting more sediment than they used to. Yeah, sediment just builds up, I guess. Although I bet climate change has some sort of connection. I just haven't, you know, read about it yet. Germany has targeted three to build three new wind turbines a day to reach its goal of becoming climate neutral by 2045. So they decided three new wind turbines a day. Now, you might say, pretty ambitious. But in 2016, and I remember hearing about this, uh, we didn't have the podcast at the time, but if we did, we would have talked about it. China was building two per hour, according to the International Energy Association. Back in 2016. IEA. Yeah. So uh, 2022 has been quite the year in climate litigation. Brian, 47 new cases filed in 25 jurisdictions with uh, global cr climate crisis uh, cases more than doubling since from you know 2015 to, I think it's 2,000 a day right now. Uh, uh, and that's 2,000 today. Totally, yeah. With courts expanding the responsibilities of polluters and governments, so that's a good thing. China's GA Solar, the world's fourth largest solar panel maker by capacity, get this, is going to open its first factory in the United States where they don't build solar panels, generally speaking. They're all built in China. Uh, this is what Biden was trying to do, and it looks like the bugger is going to get it done. It looks like some they're going to start. It's, it's pretty modest. I think it's a $60 million investment, but still, uh, yeah. Clean energy manufacturing growth boom is going to happen because of laws passed late last year. So this is down in Phoenix, where they're going to uh, build a factory. And who knows what else is going to happen in the coming days. We'll keep you posted. Uh, several Chinese automakers are slated to enter the United States this year. We're talking about this as first of the show. When are they coming yeah. to North America? Looks like it's going to be this year. And nobody knows who's going to be first, but predictions are it'll be BYD. Uh, the big builder of cars and combustion and otherwise, actually, in China. But they're stopping combustion cars right now. And buses, electric buses. This is according to uh, an EV forecaster that I follow on Twitter. Anyway, I think that, you know, it's going to be very interesting to see when the first ones come because they're already, we talked about it last week, they're already in the UK by 100,000 or something. Yeah, and a few like to places like Norway, but uh, we've been waiting for that invasion of um, EVs from China into North America and uh, should come this year. Carbon, tractors, Carbon Tracker says the UK could suffer 500,000 job losses and be forced to spend 674 billion pounds of taxpayer cash bailing out banks unless the city prepares for the value of fossil fuels to collapse. This is uh, London. Um, 
Unless London prepares for the value of fossil fuels to collapse as a result of climate crisis regulations. So this is what we fear, right? We see this coming. You and I see it coming. Our listeners see it coming. We know it's coming. A lot of people don't, including the people in power. And there's going to be a big, big bill for bailing out oil companies uh, in the future. The IEA's... Uh, Energy Technology Perspectives 2023 is out. This is a report. It shows that we are entering a new industrial age, the age of clean energy technology manufacturing, they say. And this will create new markets worth hundreds of billions of dollars and millions of jobs this decade. So that has started. We are in a new age. Finally this week, vibrating pipe. Notice during testing brings another delay to the Volpel uh, nuclear expansion project in Georgia. So we've been talking about the Georgia as the only one in North America getting built. It's way overdue, way over budget, and now they've got another problem with pipes vibrating. No vibrating pipes in solar panels, Brian. Yeah, you, you can't have vibrating pipes in a nuclear power plant, I assume? <laughs> well, because they'll break. You know, if you have vibrating pipes at home, the, the seams will eventually break. Okay. Because they'll eventually just, you know... That, that's not ever good. You don't want the, the cooling to shut down at a nuclear plant. That's our show for this week, kids. Uh, thanks for listening. We always appreciate it. It's good to talk to you this week. Please take the time to contact us at cleanenergyshow at gmail.com. That's our email address. We're all over social media at, uh, you know, Clean Energy Show Pod is our handle. Don't forget to check out our YouTube channel for special features. And, and by God, I made a TikTok video this week. If you're new to the show, remember to subscribe on your podcast app to get new episodes delivered every week. Brian, another one bites the dust. We'll see you again next week. See you next week.